In the final days of 1921, Frederick Banting and his team learned to synthesize insulin in a laboratory in Toronto. The discovery was soon proclaimed as a miracle cure for diabetes, but that turned out to be not quite right. It was certainly a spectacular advance, but it wasn't a cure. An obstacle still remained. The challenge now was to improve the discovery, purify it, mass produce it, and then distribute it to everyone who needed it, many just barely clinging to life. Our story resumes. By the winter of 1922, Banting's team was hand-making small batches of the miracle hormone and administering it to their patients. The success stories were remarkable. But the Toronto team could barely keep up with the small number of patients in clinical trials. What was worse were the countless people worldwide clamoring for a chance to get relief from the starvation diets that had kept them alive just long enough to see the great discovery. If they couldn't find a bigger supply of insulin, the patients who had survived and those who had tasted the promise of insulin would simply waste away and die. In the early days, you got all the chilled beef or pork pancreas that you could, and then you ground it up and you began the extraction process. The real problem was how to get to, to go from a soup of ground up pancreas to pure, crystal pure insulin. The Toronto team was overwhelmed. They needed more money, better facilities, and most importantly, time to figure out the complex chemical work. But time was not something they had on their side. They were running out of insulin, and with limited patient data, a short supply of hormone, and no means to mass produce, there seemed an insurmountable gap between healing a single patient and mass producing the miracle hormone. The one person who was really enthusiastic was a man named George Clues, who happened to be the research director for Eli Lilly and Company of Indianapolis. Clues said to McLeod and Banning, gee, this looks good. We'd like to collaborate with you in developing it. The Canadians initially declined, hoping to resolve production problems on their own. But then, disaster. The insulin was gone. Fred Banting went back to Eli Lilly and the large American drug company agreed to take on the challenge of mass-producing the hormone for distribution in North America. The results were astounding, changing the lives of people with diabetes forever. Meanwhile, Danish scientist August Crow traveled to Toronto with a personal interest. His wife Marie had been diagnosed with diabetes, and Crow knew that her only hope for survival was the availability of insulin in their home country. He went to Toronto to ask permission to mass-produce it, and when the answer was yes, he went back to Denmark to start what eventually became Novo Nordisk. So the two big insulin producers, in fact, have their roots back in 1922. Lilly because a, of an enterprising research director. Novo Nordisk because August Krogh's wife had become diabetic and he wanted to know how to make insulin so he could save his wife's life. Marie Krogh survived. And when insulin hit the commercial market in late 1923, millions of patients around the world saw a renewed chance at life. Every story was different, but Bob Cleveland is certainly representative of those early recipients. He was five years old, living in Syracuse, New York, when he was diagnosed with diabetes. I remember my mother said I was skin and bones when I did go to the hospital. Bob learned young that even with insulin, treatment for diabetes required rigid management. He was lucky enough to have a mother up to the challenge. Occasionally she'd have to buy a loaf of sliced bread. A slice of that bread would weigh maybe 30 grams, so she'd have to cut a piece of it off or cut the crust off so that I only had 20 grams. A few years later, Bob's older brother Gerald was also diagnosed with diabetes. When I was diagnosed, uh, I felt that uh, the world kind of dumped in on me and uh, I was... Uh, going to have a different kind of life. And with two boys suffering from diabetes, administering insulin required a brutal routine. It was morning, noon, and dinner time. My mother would give it to me in my legs, and then after they got out of commission because of so many shots, uh, I had it in my uh, arms. We had needles that had to be sharpened with a whetstone and boiled up after every use. Testing sugar levels also required an extreme effort by today's standards. There were no quick blood tests or easy home kits. Readings required boiling urine samples in a test tube with chemicals multiple times each day. 
But it wasn't just the mechanics that made living with the disease so difficult. Life expectancies weren't measured in weeks anymore. They were up to more than 30 years. For the first time ever, people were living on insulin with diabetes. They and the people around them were facing a lot of new challenges. I didn't like to be separated out from the normal group. And uh, uh, so I would say very little about it and uh, keep it quiet as much as I could. We dated for about six months before she found out that I was a diabetic. And I was afraid she'd back off and just like employers did when they found out. The brothers continued to manage their diabetes. Over the next five decades, technology created dramatic changes in the way they and everyone else around them lived. But surprisingly little changed in the treatment of diabetes. Really no breakthroughs in insulin production is very frustrating for everybody. Until in the early 1980s, you entered a new era. Scientists figured out how to inject insulin genes into self-replicating cells through DNA recombinant therapy. It was an extraordinary moment. Finally, an endless supply of pure human insulin no longer dependent on animal extraction. DNA technology has unleashed a whole new wave of developments. Long-lasting basal insulins like Levomir and Lantus and rapid-acting, more efficient insulins such as Novolog and Humalog are available today. Home testing devices have gone a long way to give patients more control over their own management and delivery systems have dramatically improved. Thinner needles, disposable syringes, pens, pumps, and more. But the power of the insulin story is most evident in the children whose lives it saved. Elizabeth Hughes lived until 1982 and became a wife, mother, and grandmother. Bob Cleveland's older brother Gerald lived to age 93, surviving over 75 years with diabetes thanks to the miracle of insulin. And nearly 90 years after Fred Banting conceived of a crazy idea, Bob Cleveland stands as a shining example of the power of this discovery and the millions of lives it has saved. I've been on insulin for 35 years. 26 years. 13 years now. 12 and a half years? Eight years. About a year and a half. A year and two weeks. To think of a condition that prior to the discovery of insulin that was completely untreatable, that patients died because of the lack of being able to receive insulin is inconceivable today. My insulin is like my best friend. Uh, it's a love-hate relationship. <laughs> the reality is when I, when I take the insulin, I'm not different anymore. And this is what insulin allows me to do. It allows me as a type 2 diabetic to be normal. Insulin technically is the chemical that allows your body to, to use what you're, you're eating for energy, but um, without insulin, you couldn't survive. It's a stage in the development of treating diabetes. It's not the final stage, it's not the first stage, but it's where we are. We'll be right back. We all need insulin to survive. Some of us don't make enough. And to some of us, the insulin we make doesn't work well enough, as well as not having quite enough of it. This is what causes diabetes. We need to understand how the normal pancreas works and how insulin is both made and released into the circulation in order to produce more effective medicines. Nova Nordis is working to defeat diabetes at all stages of its progression. Our history in working with the insulin molecule and our detailed knowledge of its structure has allowed us to develop new types of insulin, insulin analogs that are designed to meet the individual needs of patients with diabetes and couple these insulins with easy to use devices to improve the way patients use this insulin. Nova Nordisk is working to develop new treatments that target some of the many defects in diabetes. We're working on the development of a derivative of a naturally occurring human hormone that increases insulin secretion. We're looking at ways to decrease the amount of excess glucose made by the liver, and we're exploring, in addition, compounds that affect both glucose 
and lipid levels in diabetes. The outcomes from these studies are part of our evolving commitment to improve the outcomes for patients with diabetes and ultimately to defeat diabetes.